Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, now, we're moving from the cornea to the evaluation uh, of the patient using the Pentagam IX way for cataract and refractive surgery and look at new features and new displays that we see there now. Uh, so, these are my, my disclosures. So, now we have actually 20 years anniversary of the, of the Pentacom. Uh, the very first launch was at the Academy in uh, 2002, and then it was followed by 2007 by the Pentacom uh, HR. And then came the AXL at the ESCRS actually in 2015, and uh, three years, four years later, the AXL wave uh, was launched at, at the ESCRS as well just before COVID. And then we had, of course, uh, some problems during the last uh, two, three years. So the Pentacom IXL wave in uh, a clinical practice or in a cataract and refractive practice can be used, of course, as you've seen here, for screening of comorbidities, ectasia, refractive display for corneal surgery, the ABCD, billion ABCD staging and progression. You've heard that already. We can plan with the information, fake IOL implantation, cataract pre uh, display, and also IOL calculation with newest formulas. Everything is integrated to look for uh, best IOL selection. And of course, also integrated optical biometry. You don't need an extra axial length measurement device anymore. It's all in there. And what is also very interesting is the visualization of the vision quality, which you can use pre and post operatively for yourself, for the patient to, as an educational tool, or actually to find out, let's say post operatively, what is the problem here in the patient who is complaining. And he may even have 20 20 vision, but still has some issues. So the novel features in the uh, uh, wave uh, you can see here uh, objective refraction. Visual performance analysis was uh, added, and IOL calculation is uh, uh, upgraded and updated uh, all the time here, also for every corneal shape. The PENTACAM now stands for the five function of aberometry of the entire eye, objective refraction, retroillumination, optical biometry, and the basic Scheinflug tomography where it all started. So the new full sequence overview display now looks like uh, like this here in a, in a fake eye, uh, for example. You have the uh, toggle switch between the both eyes, OD, OS. You have here the refraction uh, display, and this is quite interesting also depending on pupil size. So night and day, you see different pupil sizes and what impact that has on the uh, refraction, which is, I think, quite interesting to see. Then you have the keratometry here with all parameters, uh, which, for example, also relate to a previous laser vision correction uh, a patient, and you can uh, identify that also. Um, the optical axis are displayed here, and your chamber depths, and axial lengths, and so on. Then there's an interesting thing here, visual performance. You're looking at the total uh, 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 eye aberration, corneal, internal, and total eye aberration, and also related to pupil size. So you can say during the day, a patient is looking like this, and at night, when the pupil is larger, you can see that we have an issue here, uh, and the vision, become, vision quality becomes worse. So very interesting new feature they have here. And there's a retroillumination uh, photo, a little bit bigger than it used to be in the, in the previous uh, overview sequence. So let's go for an example uh, here. Uh, for example, painkiller here, post myopic laser surgery uh, profile, as you can see here, the total corneal refractive power map. You see that already. If you look at the axial lengths, you see this is a, should be a myopic eye, but it has only a refraction of minus one or even less. So the uh, uh, um, process of, of laser vision correction can be identified. Also, if you look here at the high order aberration, because spherical aberration of 0.4 is fairly high. So these are all the things that reminds you this is an eye post, post LASIK. Yeah, you also have flat and thin cornea, and then also the back front ratio uh, is here at 75.9%. Uh, if it would be around 80%, it would be a normal eye. So the visual performance, as I just mentioned in the, in the previous slide, you have the corneal aberration, the internal aberration, so the intraocular lens or the, the cataract or the uh, natural lens, then the total uh, performance here, as you can see here. And a uh, reason, for example, here could be cataract, presbyopia, anything. 
So in everyday practice, uh, I use this for the visualization. Uh, we use also the retronomination photos, not only to uh, identify and also do a densitometry of the uh, uh, cataract, but also to look at the IOL axis, for example, or IOL decentration. And here the whole tool has been upgraded very much, which is also very nice. If you look at your toric lenses, uh, I will show you uh, in a while. Before we go into that uh, cases, I want to inform you about the normative data study group that we have founded with, uh, with uh, Oculus. And we are attempting actually to gather data from all over the world, like a global thing in all continents. Uh, we have groups participating and we're collecting data now. And we want to set what, what is the standard, what is normal. Because we measure so many things and uh, it's nice to know that you have measured something, but you don't even know, is that normal? What is that in relation to age? How does it change when pupil changes? Whatever. So there's a lot of uh, knowledge that we need to acquire here. We are starting already with some of the data. This is a small subgroup here, Caucasian uh, normative data set, uh, uh, done in Germany, Italy, and Spain, where we looked at the Pentacom IXL wave data uh, in only fakey guys uh, without any uh, pathology. So this is... Uh, uh, a, s a sample for this, so to say, but we want to have that on a global scale. Uh, we have around 1,100 patients. You see all the parameters here uh, regarding the uh, corneal and uh, high-order aberrations, um, optical axis, corneal optical density, and so on. And also we look at the dependency of each parameter to age, uh, refraction, uh, gender, pupil size, and, and looked at this. So let's look at the ocular aperometry. The limiting factor here actually is, uh, is the pupil size. In a lot of studies, you always have to check out what is the aperture, whatever they measured was related to. And uh, we don't really want to artificially dilate the pupil, which has some, some uh, impact. So the very first measurement uh, in a darkened room uh, um, is the measurement uh, in, in a mesopic condition here with the Pentacom RXL waves and uh, it's done, uh, the, uh, it will do the ocular aperometry first without any glare. So the Scheinflug uh, uh, movement, when they look at this, this comes later. And um, so we can assure that we have the possible largest natural pupil during this uh, uh, procedure. And when we look at it, and we actually looked at the data here of these patients, and we separated them in younger and older patients, uh, it was quite interesting to see that even in the older age group, in 70% uh, of the patient, we had a natural pupil of four millimeter or more, and this is uh, very good for measuring uh, um, all the aperometry uh, data. You can see that here, uh, how this develops over uh, uh, the pupil size. So if we look at pupil diameter, photopic, mesopic, and we correlate this with age, you can see here uh, a stronger correlation uh, with, uh, with the mesopic uh, pupil uh, di diameter, and these are 1,082 uh, uh, patients here, a stronger correlation uh, also here. So pupil goes down uh, in the, let's say, the cataract group versus the refractive group or the presbyopia group. Strong correlation, as I said, just for mesopic. If you look between male and, and, and female, there's actually a significant difference, interestingly. Uh, even though it doesn't look so much, uh, with this uh, amount of data, you can uh, figure out uh, the distances here uh, for photic and mesopic pupil diameter. It's a slight difference, but it is. So, cord mu, cord alpha, um, which is like angle kappa and angle alpha, but it's measured as a distance, so that's why it's called cord and not, not, an, not an angle. Um, there's so much going on when you talk about in refractive surgery and multifocal lenses, what is normal, what is not normal. Uh, and so we looked at the cord mu, which is the distance between the pupil center and the uh, uh, first Burkinia image, so to say, the vertex normal. As I said, this is also referred to as angle kappa. And the cord alpha is a distance between the geometrical center of the cornea from limbus to limbus measured in the middle and the first Burkinia image or the, the vertex normal, and which is also called angle or uh, related to angle uh, alpha. And, and these are the pictures here. This is natal, this is temporal, this is right, this is left. And we have a, a very, very similar distribution in both eyes. There are no differences between gender, right eye or left eye. And uh, we're getting quite a bit of, of data out uh, of the study here now. And um, here you see also temporal and uh, nerve form called alpha. 
uh, you see a slight difference to, of course, uh, to um, Engel, Engel Alpha, Engel Kappa, but again, right and left eye uh, uh, and gender has no, no impact uh, on this. And we could see actually uh, a low correlation to spherical equivalent. So uh, the higher the hyperopia, the more the higher is uh, called mu, as you can see here. Something that we already know, uh, uh, but it's quite interesting to see that uh, this is also reflected here. And this is a moderate to, to lose uh, a correlation, as we see. And I'm, I'm wondering if there are differences among the different uh, countries that we will see or the different uh, continents, uh, especially the Asian and the, and the Northern European uh, Caucasian population. We'll see that uh, on the long run when we go on with our study. And here's the code alpha, similar correlation uh, also uh, as we've seen with uh, the other one. Let's look at the wavefront aberrations. Uh, so if we have the beam getting in the eye and then being reflected and uh, we, we uh, assess the spherical wavefront in a perfect eye, we have the total eye aberrations. And uh, if we have, for example, a, a myopic eye, we have a certain uh, defocus which we can see. Or if we have some other uh, uh, aberrated wavefront of the eye, we can see that uh, uh, with the machine. And uh, the high order aberration, the, the, the total or the sum is built from the corneal aberration. It's influenced by pupil size and the internal uh, aberration. And the corneal aberration consists of the front and back. And they are summarized in the pentagram axial wave measurement when we talk about the total eye aberrations. Uh, as you can see here on the display that I showed you also before. In the, in the uh, high order operations, what we are looking at is, uh, we, don't, we don't have a perfect eye, as, as a matter of fact. Uh, he, the perfect eye would see a point source of light just as a point source, but uh, the aberration change and distort the light spot, and this is, of course, uh, more visible in the night, and what we see is a typical thing. This looks like a comet here, uh, the coma, or we have the trefoil, where we have different directions, usually three directions, that's why it's called trefoil. And uh, then spheric operation, which consists of a, a number of things like halo starbursts, ghost images, and uh, also lead to reduced uh, contrast sensitivity. For the patient, he has no idea what that is. The patient is just complaining and saying, I don't see well. Uh, and he can have a good smell and acuity, but he can see complain about the visual uh, quality. So what is normal with these values? And again, you see here the distribution of, of, of the cloud, so to say, the high order operation of the cornea for millimeter uh, uh, area. And you see here the change with age yeah, of the total eye as well uh, uh, as the cornea. And if you look at this, this is quite interesting. Here are the corneal uh, aberration. And you may all know that uh, the first aspheric lens were based on, on measurement of like 70 patients uh, when, when J and J introduced uh, the Technus lens with spherical aberration correction of minus 0.27 microns. And funny enough, looking at 1,000 patients, we have exactly the same average value. However, there is no, no individual patient with that because we have a, a clear a correlation with age. We start at 0.18 uh, in, the, in the younger group, and this becomes a bit more and more and almost doubles uh, in, in the cataract patients, where the average 0.37. And you also see that the standard deviation is changing and is almost uh, also doubling from the younger group to the uh, elderly group. So it is true, we have this value, but uh, in all these decades, and I think we, will, we won't really see much different values if we uh, increase this, it will be fine-tuned, but this is a quite interesting information that we've seen here. Let's uh, go to some uh, clinical uh, cases here. Um, now we will look at the advantage we have from the display, for example, on, uh, on the retroillumination image and the uh, axial uh, uh, measurement of the axis of an, of an uh, toric lens, for example. So here's a patient, is hyperopic, has uh, three diopters, or two, one, uh, 2 3 diopters of astigmatism. This is his refraction, so he has a little bit more in the prescription. And he gets uh, uh, an IOL calculation, uh, trifocal toric lens, as a re refractive lens exchange for presbyopia treatment. And um, if we take the data uh, that we measured and put it in the uh, Calculator here, it was uh, supposed to be an eye hands lens uh, from J&J. &J. They have their calculator, and this, what we get recommended is uh, 3.75 uh, uh, 
torus, uh, and you see here the data. The residual uh, outcome would be minus 0 0.03 diopter at 114 degrees. If we actually look at the data uh, that the uh, uh, Barrett calculator gives us in within the uh, pentacam with all the data, it's quite interesting because here we have a lower uh, uh, toric uh, calculation, a three diopter, with a similar, uh, almost identical uh, uh, outcome being predicted. So of course we took what J and J uh, told us to, to do. So the patient got uh, uh, this, this implantation here, and he ended actually up. Uh, this was the, the predicted value, and he ended up like this. So we kind of overcorrected here. And we also had an excess flip, as you can see here. With this correction, you could see very well. So what, what can we do in a situation like this? Uh, first of all, when we look at the uh, um, uh, measurement, here you see a little video sequence. You, know, you can adapt here the measurement of the axis, and you can also look for the decentration of the uh, lens, uh, uh, a slight decentration here. And uh, then we get the measurement here, and uh, we can see exactly uh, what the value is uh, that we have here, 33 degrees uh, and 0.52 millimeter uh, of, uh, uh, of decentration here, as you can see here. So we can very accurately uh, measure that nowadays, and I think this is, is great as a display uh, to use that also for our, our patient. So what can you do now? Well, in former times, we used the uh, uh, Birdle uh, from astigmatismfix.com uh, webpage, where you put in uh, the, the data of the lens, the current refraction, and then it's calculating for you the ideal position of the lens and how you have to uh, uh, change, change it. And you will see that we, as we have a too high a cylinder uh, uh, in the correction, we, we're getting some residual astigmatism here as a expected residual uh, uh, refraction. And uh, they say we have to go to 19 degrees to change that. What is the Pentacam doing? Well, the Pentacam has a lot of features in this uh, aspect. It also looks at the pseudophagic refraction, as you can see here. Then uh, look at all the other exams that we have. Uh, uh, looks at the lenses that you have and what has been implanted, and then it offers you three methods, uh, exchange of a lens, or putting a piggyback onto this lens, or rotate the toric lens. So these three possibilities automatically you can get from it. It also looks if the lens is just you know dislocated or rotated, uh, which would be this here, assumed error and predicted effective lens position or it looks if this calculation was wrong because we have uh, an issue with uh, previous laser surgery or any other uh, changes of the cornea, which is a calculation error then. And then it offers you the same as the astigmatism fix uh, thing uh, and, and looks at where you have to rotate uh, the axis and what would be uh, uh, the final outcome if you do that. Uh, and here also a recommended rotation, 13 degrees uh, clockwise and they would assume that you have like half of a diopter or 0.64 diopter residual astigmatism because of the slight overcorrection that we had in the initial uh, implantation. So when we rotate the lens, uh, here again the data, and uh, after the surgery, uh, we, we got actually to a decent outcome. Uh, we didn't exchange the lens. We was minus 0.5 spherical with 0.8, which was okay in this case, but uh, we kind of thought we would have been better off if we would believe the Pentacam and not the program from the uh, uh, manufacturer. So the Pentacam IXL Wave now in its current version and, and also with these new features is, is a good fit for us, uh, especially for me in a university clinic, but we have also a big uh, cataract refractive practice. Um, we can implement the normative data more and more and this will grow and will give us a lot of information um, the, the data displays are very nice and they're getting improved. Uh, uh, and the support for like decision-making things, especially in intraocular lenses or rhetoric lenses. And also if we know a lot about the uh, high order aberration, when do we have to stop uh, considering premium lenses? Where are the, the dangers we can, uh, we can see? And I think this will be uh, an excellent option for that. And with the uh, uh, 
display of the vision quality, we have also a tool we can show the patient and say, look, this is what, what you look like now, and this is how it will change when we apply this or that uh, technology. So in this case, uh, uh, for us, it's a, a good return of investment as when we uh, uh, bought the machine and is using it every day. Uh, so it's worth uh, the uh, investment. Thank you very much.